All right, welcome everyone to the webinar, How to Leverage New Tech to Master Earned Media. <clears throat> so by way of introduction, uh, my name is Aaron Friedman. I'm the VP of Marketing here at Propel. And I'm very excited to introduce two people that are joining us today for today's session that could not be more qualified to discuss this topic as they're both co-founders and CEOs of emerging tech tools that make a huge difference in communi communicators earned media success. So first we have Rand Fishkin, the co-founder and CEO of SparkToro. Rand started SparkToro in 2018, which is a software tool that makes market research accessible to everyone. He's the author of Lost and Founder and previously founded and led Moz. He is frequently a keynote speaker on marketing and entrepreneurship. And on a personal note, he has been very influential to my own career as a marketer and be it through his writing, videos, or even the one-on-one -on -one time that I get with him at conferences throughout the years. Um, he's been extremely helpful and valuable and, and just a great friend all around. And also a man who needs no introduction at all, our fearless leader, Zach Cutler. He's the co-founder and CEO of Propel. Zach's a true innovator. He's on a mission to modernize the PR industry. And for those that don't know, he's the former mid-sized PR agency owner. He was named by Forbes as one of the 20, as one of the 20 entrepreneurs shaking up the New York tech scene and named one of the 100 most influential tech PR agency executives globally. He's a member of the Young Entrepreneur Council and Forbes Agency Council, and is published in the Wall Street Journal, Entrepreneur and Inc. So welcome both of you, and we are excited to get started over here. Thanks, so, Aaron. Just a, just a really quick um, housekeeping note. So for the agenda tonight, um, <clears throat> after a quick introduction of Propel, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to do a quick deep dive into the latest data on earned media today. Um, and then we're going to dive into the elements of PR management and audience insights that make for a masterful strategy, followed by a Q&A. And I hope you have your questions ready because these two guys are the best to answer them. So at any point during the webinar, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A and we will make sure to get to all of them. So a little bit about Propel. Propel was founded in 2019 and we're on a mission to really democratize the PR and technology and make PR and technology accessible for the masses. Propel is reimagining earned media and has launched many first of a kind features, including the industry's only native Gmail and Outlook email pitch plugins. Our platform helps marketing and communications professionals connect with journalists and influencers, earned media, cover earned media coverage and measure impact. <clears throat> We're headquartered in Tel Aviv with teams based across the globe in New York, London, Miami, and we even have a team driving around the US in an RV. Yeah. <laughs> Propel has over 150 customers, including Real Chemistry, Textron, Insurify, and other leading brands and agencies. So without further ado, I want to pass it over to Zach, who's going to start diving into the data a little bit more. Awesome. Thanks so much, Aaron. Um, and thanks so much, Aaron, for joining us. Really been excited and looking forward to this. So yeah, my pleasure, Zach. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. By the way, I read Lost and Founder a couple of years ago. It had a big impact on me. So oh, big fan. Um, honored to hear that. So I wanted to start off by touching on some of the data findings that we've produced at Propel. Um, as Aaron was mentioning, we love data and we're on a mission to uh, bring innovation and also to help make PR more data driven. Um, and so as someone who used to own an agency, it was always a big passion of mine to make PR more data driven, always been a numbers guy, a math guy. And I feel like PR is one of those disciplines where, of course, it's always going to be extremely creative. It's always going to be, you know, that elusive factor, uh, building those relationships, coming up with those interesting story angles. But when you're able to marry that with data and insights, I feel like that's where the magic can really happen. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do at Propel. Um, and so each quarter we release a study called the Propel Media Barometer. And we look at over a million pitches that were sent uh, by real PR people to real journalists. And uh, we come out with some findings. So uh, in our Q1 study, um, we came up with a few interesting points um, and a few interesting trends that I think can help inform a good earned media strategy. Um, so if we go to the next slide, 
Um, what we've been finding is that quarter over quarter, the average journalist response rate just keeps going down. And this isn't just happening quarter over quarter, um, it's also happening year over year, which is pretty scary. Um, so you can see here in 2021, you know, in Q1, the, the average response rate to a PR pitch was about 4%. And then it steadily went down to just a tiny bit over 3%. Uh, and if we look at the year over year difference, it literally went down by a third from 2020 to 2021. And the reason that I think this is really an important point is that in a sense, earned media is broken because, you know, we've had this proliferation of media outlets. Uh, we've had, you know, in the last 20 years, there's no longer, you know, 10 or 20 journalists that you got to pitch. You have to have, you know, hundreds of influencers and bloggers and journalists that you want to pitch uh, so that you get your story in front of your audience. But yet there haven't been, you know, until now, tools like Propel and SparkToro to actually help people do that. And so, um, Ren, I'm wondering from your perspective, like, what do you think are the common things that people miss in their earned media strategy? Well, uh, I mean, that's a very, very broad question, Zach. <laughs> but um, I, think, I think that certainly if we look over just the last few years, one of the challenges that I see in PR and earned media is that it has become a very crowded space as tons and tons of uh, digital marketing tactical people have filled up that space. And as there's been sort of more incentive for uh, coverage from the vast numbers of businesses that are now trying to earn it. So you just have this much, much more crowded space. It's a lot like SEO or content marketing or social media marketing or influencer marketing, right? All of these tactics over the last, especially I'd say 10 years, and then even more heavily the last three or four accelerated by the pandemic and everything going online. It just means that whereas you were competing with a hundred other PRs for this journalist time and attention, now it's 500. <laughs> and, and in two years, it's going to be a thousand. Yeah. So uh, Madeline, I think you're absolutely right. More pitches being sent, more people trying to pitch, uh, more noise, very, very challenging, I think, for the journalist to find signal. And then Zach, I'm sure you have a lot of empathy for this too, as I do, which is if you are a professional journalist or a, a media owner, content creator of any kind, um, the last few years have been particularly brutal, right? We've seen a ton of like private equity firms buy up, you know, the whatever, the media outlets and the publications and the small business, uh, small uh, journals and newspapers, they aggregate them, they try to cut costs, they make it so that journalism, I think there was, there was a good analysis recently, right, that you, you've got something like, um, I think it's on the, in the realm of like a third of all the journalists who work for one of the top 200 publications um, have a residence or live in Brooklyn, right? And like these four zip codes in Brooklyn, because you basically have to have kind of a partner or a family or something that's supporting you. You can't really make a living as a journalist on your own. It's, it's a brutal, weird world. Yeah, I, I love that point. And like, I think you're right with the proliferation of all the outlets, what's happening is like, um, from the PR side, I think a lot of people are, um, you know, blasting out these pitches. Sometimes they, you know, it's called spray and pray or, or whatnot. And it just, you know, it goes to a point that uh, Trevor mentioned here in the comments that like, just like sales, you know, you're, you can't really blast out to all these different prospects and just throw spaghetti at the wall and hope for, you know, uh, an article to get published. You, you know, it's about, building those one-to-one -one relationships in a proper tool, like, and getting those audience insights, um, which I love about SparkToro and, and kind of then managing those relationships in a CRM for PR. Um, so moving along to the next data point, um, this one is really interesting. So we looked at like 
what makes for a good subject line? And are you making the right first impression? Um, and what we found was that there was a huge difference in response rate um, to subject lines that have between one and five words um, and subject lines that have uh, over 15 words. And so I think this is, you know, a somewhat common, you know, commonly known thing in the sales world um, and in general, but it's interesting to apply this to PR pitches and to actually, you know, get the data that, um, yeah, that, you know, your subject line should be a certain length. Um, I mean, and Zach, course, sorry to interrupt. Um, this data is from uh, essentially pitches that you looked at inside Propel? Yeah, exactly. So we analyzed almost a million and a half real pitches um, that our users have sent in Propel to real journalists. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, that is just, that is just powerful. And like, you know, the importance of um, keeping that subject line short. Um, do you have any other thoughts around about how to sort of keep a pitch from sounding cold and how to kind of, you know, get in there uh, with a journalist, even if you don't know them from before? Okay, but this is my number one secret trick, Zach. Like, <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not actually kidding. I believe right now I have a close to 99% success rate with this tactic. It's a little bit cheating, but it works <laughs> almost every time. And that is, I, I almost never send a cold pitch. I basically have an interaction with the person or publication or creator or source of influence, podcast host, whatever that I want to reach out to. I, I interact with them on Twitter and on LinkedIn before I reach out to them. And then when I send the email, it's like, uh, hey, regarding our chat on LinkedIn the other day. Mm -hmm. it, it just, no, nobody is like, oh yeah, that person was chatting with me on LinkedIn. I should delete their message. Yeah, that you know, it kind of works. I love that. I really love that. I was just pitching um, some Propel News and I did that uh, and got, you know, this, this reporter from VentureBeat, which is really a hard publication to get responses from, but I connected with him on LinkedIn. Um, we messaged and then he was like, hey, shoot me an email. And then, you know, now he's reviewing the news and, you know, it, he might publish it. So, yeah, I, I love I'm that. not saying I don't have a hundred percent success rate with like getting the coverage or the thing I want, but I always get a response, right? Mm -hmm. So like you, you get that engagement back. Uh, the one, by the way, that almost never fails to get the actual coverage is if I get the warm intro. Yeah. Warm intro is, uh, is the best for sure. Yeah. Like, would you, would you intro me to the guy at VentureBeat or, you know, whatever the woman over at the wall street journal or something. And that. But I, I don't think you have to scale PR. I think I'd rather have a low number of outreach, high success rate than high outreach, low success rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And you know, one of the things that we uh, built in Propel that we felt was key to that approach is like understanding who on your team may have a, uh, an existing relationship. So, you know, take a big agency or even an in-house team that has 10, 20, 50 people. You know, if you're pitching, you know, Sarah at Forbes, you know, it's likely that someone on the team has an existing relationship. And like, when you use a PRM like Propel, you can actually, see, oh yeah, my colleague, Sam, you know, literally has a 20% publish rate with Sarah. Like let's or, have- Or they follow you on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Like exactly. if they already follow you and you can DM them, ah, uh, right? This is, <laughs> I, I feel like these practices sort of come together, right? If you're a content creator and you do, you know, content that earns you a following and attention, then you can leverage that for PR stuff. And if you have a social media following, you can leverage that. And if you're a great networker, you can go to LinkedIn and you can leverage that. And if you're someone who builds it offline at conferences and events, you know, like all this stuff works together. It's not a stay in your lane, single practice, uh, tactical marketing kind of thing anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, if we go to the next data point, um, we looked at 
the topics that are being pitched the most and then the response rate of each of those topics. Um, and to no surprise, like health and fitness, which was the most pitched topic, had the lowest response rate. And I think, you know, if you have an overrepresentation of a certain topic that's being pitched, then it just kind of makes sense that there might be an underrepresentation of responses. Um, if we look at, you know, some of these business and industrial, for example, um, which was the second most pitch topic, actually had one of the highest response rates, uh, almost four and a half percent. Tech was was lower. Art and entertainment did quite well, um, and finance did well. And so I think the takeaway from this is, you know, it's so important to be topical to, you know, somehow weave your company news or your product news or whatever you're pitching um, into something that's going on in the world that, you know, may be relevant. Um, and so, you know, that's my main takeaway from this. Um, I mean, you're, you know, you've built an awesome tool that's all about audience insights. So like from your perspective, how, how do people maximize their success by pitching the right topic to the right audience? Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things that's sort of a cheat code for a lot of folks who use SparkToro. And to be clear, SparkToro is still quite small. There's only three of us. We only have about 1,200 or so customers. But um, the fo for the folks who use it primarily for you know, outreach, PR, pitching, that kind of thing, it's a big part of it is basically finding the outlets that they're the sources of influence that their audience pays attention to, and then pitching them with data about those audiences, right? So they might say, hey, Right now in the finance sector, there's a ton of, you know, there's a ton of people online who are talking about um, interest rates uh, and mortgage interest rates going up and how that's going to affect hot, you know, metro markets in the US. And we have the CEO of Redfin for you who, you know, has some data from our platform and can, and can speak to that, you know, would you be up for a conversation and they're like oh okay that's that's great and you know this can work on a super small scale too we, we have plenty of um customers and agencies who are pitching for like very tiny brands challenger brands local brands and they do kind of the same thing like hey you know local weekly in portland this restaurateur is you know overcoming the challenge of hiring folks in this sort of no one wants to work in restaurant industry market and here's how they're doing it would you be up for a story about that you can see lots of people talking about that in the industry that help that helps with the pitch i i think that anytime you can use data to tell a journalist or a source of influence this is what your audience cares about and here i have the stats to prove it that's very powerful, right? You can you can do that with search volume, right? Google Trends or something like that. You can do it with, um, you know, social media data from something like a brand watch. You can do it with sort of, full, full, you know, uh, audience data from something like SparkToro. But those are, I think, really compelling pitches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Um, it's all even though it's kind of an interesting paradox because even though the um, the world of media has proliferated exponentially just specifically because of that it's like more important than ever to narrow cast and not to not to spray and pray so you've got this huge world of all these different influencers and journalists and when you can properly narrow cast and find the right ones that's where the that's where the magic will really happen um so if we move to the next slide i think and I touched on this a little bit earlier, you know, the importance of one-to-one -one journalist intel and influencer intel um, is so critical. That's why, you know, we've built this uh, as a central part of our, of our platform, you know, understanding the preferences. So we actually, you know, analyze all the pitches that were sent to this reporter or to any reporter, and then we extract using NLP you know, the, the topics of those pitches that the reporter engaged with. So we're able to tell, okay, you know, here are the top five topics that Samantha, you know, will respond to cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, et cetera. Um, and then even taking it a step further and saying, 
this is the day of the week and this is the time of the day that Samantha, you know, most interacts with pitches. Um, so kind of, yeah, understanding, you know, what are the specific preferences, um, you know, of each journalist that you're pitching um, and tailoring your pitch, not just the content, but even something like the timing uh, of when you send that. Um, and so one thing I wanted to ask you, Rand, was like, what else do you think teams should be doing manually um, from a research perspective to understand, you know, um, you know, the people they're pitching and to maximize their, their pitch? Uh, again, I, I, I have one that's been very successful for us and some of our customers it's inspired by one of our uh, early beta testers, actually, which is they... Um, they, just, they found some of the sources of influence and then they essentially followed their social channels and just got alerts. So they got kind of a daily digest of like, hey, here's these five, I can't remember, I think they used if this, then that, the IFTTT. And so then they, they followed them on Twitter and LinkedIn and they looked at, hey, whenever our source of influence kind of posts something to Twitter. So if Samantha here posts something to Twitter about wealth management, we're going to see that in our digest and we're going to know now's the time reach out right hey regarding your tweet <laughs> right mm -hmm. like you sent that. this thing you must have some interest in it here's this highly relevant thing that's happening in our world Let, let's do something together and it just feels very um it feels very organic and authentic and helpful instead of hey will you cover me yeah i really love that it reminds me of like you know, in the last five, 10 years, it's become almost a science of how fast, you know, a company should reply to an inbound demo request or inbound sales meeting request. And this is kind of reminds me of that process. Like someone, you know, tweets about something that might be related to your, you know, your client or your brand, jump on it like right away, you know, don't pitch them a week later, you know, jump on that immediately. Um, mm. Yeah. I, I mean, this, it's a, it's a very, I think it's challenging, like it adds complexity to your job, but if you can get that kind of daily digest or whatever, you, you can set it up to do it twice a day, right? Um, that could be very, very useful and potentially give you opportunities that you would have otherwise not even thought of, not even had, right? Because a lot of times, I, I think, unfortunately, um, a lot of pitching and PR and outreach goes in the, the opposite from ideal direction, right? It starts wow. from client or, or boss or team or CEO or VP of marketing or whatever says, I want coverage in publication X, right? Or, or in, in sector Y. And then the team is like, uh, okay, I guess we'll try and get that for you. Yeah. And as opposed to what is ideally happening, which is, oh, hey, the conversation around this topic from all these publications that reach the audience we want to reach is relevant to things we're doing. We should be part of that conversation. They should be covering us now. Now is the right time for us. And, and so going the, you know, the, the reverse way, and I think this is another reason why um, it's very challenging to be a PR or a journalist, right, or anyone who's a creator, is that you are essentially um, the, <laughs> the disconnect between this is relevant to the conversation and now is the time we're pitching creates a lot of challenge. Yeah, that's super interesting because it's almost like, um, in my mind, you know, the marriage of inbound and outbound. So of course, it's still outbound in a sense because the journalist didn't or influencer didn't like reach out to you. But the fact that they just tweeted about that subject and then you reach out, it's almost like a mix of inbound and outbound in a way. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, all right, nice. If we go to the next slide, um, we also took a look at um, you know, how fast journalists actually respond to pitches. And this was quite shocking. So um, if we look at you know, the first, um, if we look at the first 30 minutes, uh, almost a third of pitches are responded to, that are responded to, it happens within the first 30 minutes. Um, if we look at the first hour, 
over 40% of responses happen in that first hour. And then, you know, if we look at the same day, 70% of pitches that receive a response that happens on that same day. And so it means like, if you haven't received a response that same day, your likelihood of getting a response goes down dramatically. Like, yeah, just falls down off a cliff basically. Um, and so, you know, this kind of, to me, just underscores, you know, mastering, having the data to master the cadence of communication, you know, like understanding, um, oh, when did I pitch this? Oh, did my colleague just pitch this reporter earlier today? Oh, I'm definitely going to wait and, you know, at least see if my colleague gets a response today. I'm not going to pitch them with something else. And just kind of managing that cadence um, and, and understanding also like when and if you should follow up. So like, I think if you do one follow up after that first day and you still don't get a response within a day, then it's just like time to move on, you know, and not wait for a response because the likelihood of getting one is so low. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you have any thoughts on that, I'd be curious to hear. Um, and also like, I'd be curious to hear if you think that this in some way is connected to spray and pray, you know, the, the behavior of the journalists, or if you think that, you know, somehow this could be improved by moving away from spray and pray. This is a tough one. I mean, I want to, I want to have a lot of empathy for journalists, creators, um, sources of influence here, because my suspicion is Two, two things are going on, right? I think that when you look at the next day to two or more days, the very end of this bar graph, which is essentially only a 15% rise between, you know, a journalist responds within 24 hours after you've sent and within infinite time after that. Um, yeah. And so my suspicion is that you, you do get some kind of a mix of things in that 15%. And those are weekends, holidays, uh, deadlines, right? The journalist is working on something else. They're not even gonna bother to check their pitches. It's just, you know, out of sight, out of mind until they're done with the project. And um, holidays, vacation, out of office, all that kind of stuff, right? So I think like the way that I would play this is not to worry about this data kind of at all and mostly to focus on how do I make sure that when I'm crafting my pitch and my outreach process, that it's so personalized, human, warm intro, we've had a connection on social before, the pitch itself is very, very appropriate, the person feels a connection to me and the brand, uh, right? They, we, we have a relationship where they want to get back to me. And then I basically can send it and not worry about when they get back to me and not stress and sort of just know, hey, if they're in that 15% that doesn't respond after a day, that's fine. And also I, I think that where this data is super helpful to me is it's almost unbelievable that 70% of actual responses that come back are within one day. That strongly suggests to me that despite the fact that we are, you know, we have these broad, uh, the, this depth and breadth of, of sources out there and, you know, vast variety of places we're pitching, news is still very topical and very timely. And so you should make your pitches, right? I should make my pitches as hyper relevant to the conversation that's going on right now as possible, because clearly most of the response comes within a day. And that means if the journalist isn't thinking about it or the publication isn't thinking about it right now, it's out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Cause like, if you think about how journalism works with news cycles, this almost reminds me a little bit of, you know, a short news cycle, you know, within a, a day later and, you know, everyone's moved on and time for the next thing. Yeah. Um, so I would be curious to know if this type of uh, fast response rate curve is seen in generally in sales. Uh, I have a feeling it's a bit more condensed uh, in terms of time because of, uh, you know, the, the whole way that journalism works. Yeah, there's kind of an incentives thing too, right, where a, a journalist has a strong incentive to respond and engage if the pitch is very compelling and very timely, 
right? And they sort of, oh, I really could use you as a source for this story and I need to write it, da, da, da. And I, I have, you know, whatever, five stories on my docket for this week. Oh, great, you can be one of them, perfect. And also, you know, I think there's the, um, uh, so I don't do a lot of journalist pitching myself, but I do a tremendous amount of what I'd call source of influence pitching. So for, as an example, right, Aaron reached out to me. He said, hey, would you do this webinar with Propel, like with, with me and Zach? And of course, I'm like, yeah, let's do it. That sounds great. It's going to be super fun. Those were over the course of, you know, there were probably a 24 to 48 hours with no responses back and forth, right? It was a weekend or I was on the road or whatever it was. Um, and that's that's fine. It's a it's a relationship, not a, I don't know, more more so than a classic PR pitch. And and so the dynamic is different. Mm -hmm. In those cases, right? I think you you might want to expand beyond this data set and and think a little differently than you would about the classic media uh, journalist relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that is a very good point. And I think even within uh, PR pitching, like um, I think this type of um, data insight uh, is most relevant to news announcements and, and is a lot less relevant to sort of evergreen, you know, thought leadership byline pitching and things like that. Um, so if we move on to the last data point we have here, and by the way, if anyone has questions, continue to put them in the chat. I think we've gotten some good ones in there. Um, and we're gonna open up for Q and A in a few minutes, but this is my favorite data point. Uh, and we've seen this consistently in a few of our Propel Media Barometer white papers. Um, you know, when I was in PR and when I had my agency, I myself believed that Friday was the worst day to pitch, never pitch uh, a journalist on Friday. And every single employee I had uh, always said that. Like that, that, this was like one of the biggest truths in PR was like, do not pitch a story on Friday. Well, we actually looked at the data and we busted the myth and Friday is the best day to pitch. Um, and so I just love this because we are just showing like the importance of, of public relations management and having a system where all your data is centralized where you can understand these things like is Friday really a bad day to pitch? No, actually, it's really good. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, this one just always makes me smile. Uh, and my question for you is, you know, if you think, you know, emerging tech tools like Propel, like SparkToro, um, can help all kinds of businesses beyond just the agencies or, you know, the you know the large corporations but all kinds of even smbs you know to do pr and earned media on their own without having you know prior expertise in the field gosh i, I mean look obviously i'm incentivized partially to say yes right i i would love to say like oh you know you don't need your whatever pr person or team or consultant anymore because whatever spark toro will help you do it but that is not that is not what's happened zach i i think that this the the specialized tools um you know all, all this amazing data that, that you get out of propel and right the, the process of having data collected over time inside a crm that can be analyzed and used to show like lots of information about which journalists to pitch and when to pitch them and how to pitch them and what they respond to and what they don't and what they cover and what they don't awesome right like super super useful but to be honest, I don't think it gets someone over the gap of, I don't really understand how the universe of PR and outbound and pitching and coverage works. It, it, it takes someone who is experienced and thoughtful about that and makes them even better at their job and more efficient at their job and more effective at their job. Um, and we found the same thing with SparkToro. So <laughs> you, you were talking a minute, a minute ago about... Um, you know, sales leads and demos and all, all this kind of stuff. I, I does I assume Propel, you guys do demos. You have like a demo team and all that. Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah. So <laughs> SparkToro has a demo team, you know, <laughs> this guy, right? <laughs> like, and, and I, this is one of my most embarrassing, hopefully there's not that many people on this call. This is super embarrassing, deeply embarrassing. I have done 
about uh, maybe 60 demos for SparkToro, maybe 70 demos for SparkToro in the last, we've, we've only been live a, a little less than two years. And um, I have success, successfully, I, one time, one time I did a, a sales demo and the person who was taking the demo signed up for an account, like right after we got off the call. The other 69 times, no, <laughs> they did not sign up. So I think I'm the least effective either. I am the least effective sort of sales pitch person. Or if you think you need a demo of SparkToro, right? As opposed to like you use the free version and you just go to the pricing page and you're like, yeah, let me try that one. And you just sign up, which is what, you know, 99.99% .99 of our customers do. Then probably SparkToro isn't, either the right fit for you or the right timing. And, and I think this is um, indicative of a trend that I've seen with a ton of software businesses and a ton of tech stacks, which is essentially that when you need, if you're the kind of professional who really needs the tool and you know what you're doing and you need that tool to solve this problem right now, then it's a great fit and it works well and you sign up and like the connection is smooth and simple. And whether it's a demo or sign up online or, or whatever, you go through the process. And if instead you're like, I don't quite, what am I using this for? Why do I need this? You know, I, I like that Rand guy. Let me get him to explain it to me. I'll jump on a call with him. And then he explains it. And he's, you're sort of like, okay, well, it seems like a cool product. And, and this Rand guy seems fine, but uh, I'm not sure I need it right now. I think this is how most of the sales demos I've gone, uh, I've done have gone. And so now, now, Zach, my response to all the sales demos is, oh, I'm sorry, we're a tiny team of three and we don't do demos, but you can try it for free online. I love that. Yeah, product-led growth is the way of the future, for sure. I'm a big I mean, fan. Look, I, you, there are people out there who have built extraordinary, look at what Salesforce built, look at what HubSpot built after them. Like Those are demo-driven businesses. I don't want to uh, impugn or malign the ability of very effective sales and demo teams to get people on board with their product. But it, it's something I haven't been able to do. And I, I hope it's not <laughs> completely me. I'm sure it's partly me, but I think probably a lot of it is also timing and fit and expertise. And this speaks to your question around like, can you, if you don't know PR, just sign up for, you know, whatever Propel or SparkToro or similar web or, you know, these data plus outreach tools and get a great result? I don't think so. Yeah, I think there's, uh, there's more work to do. I mean, part of our long-term vision is to, you know, bring these workflow efficiencies to such a, uh, to a level where, you know, someone who, you know, has marketing knowledge, but may, may not be a media relations specialist, um, or, you know, knows how to generally, you know, create content, but not necessarily experienced in, you know, how to pitch journalists can kind of, you know, have finally have a tool that makes that simple, easy, you know, it reminds me a little bit of like, you know, I remember a decade ago, um, everyone used to talk about how hard it was for SMBs to, you know, uh, manage their social media. Oh, and then sure, we yeah. had tools like Hootsuite, and whatnot come out and, uh, you know, made that a lot easier. So I hope that PR is one of those fields where, um, you know, that's possible. I think it is. Um, but my, my sense is like Hootsuite's a great example. I think the overwhelming majority of their customers are social media managers, like mm -hmm. pe people who do it professionally, not, you know, I run the Mines auto body shop down on 8th. And I jump on Twitter at night, you know, like that, that's not the guy, you know, um, and, and uh, I, I have the sense that it is really the professionals who are making use of this tool. Moz was a great example of this too, right? Like Moz wanted to democratize my previous company, SEO software, democratize SEO. 99% of Moz's customers turned out to be SEO professionals, not SMBs who didn't know what they were doing with SEO, but wanted to rank in Google, that, that turned out to not be the market. It, it really was a specialized profession. I think, I think PR long-term is going to very much be the same way. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, it's uh, it's interesting to hear your perspective. Um, really enjoyed the conversation. And now uh, I'm going to hand it over to Aaron to open up to Q&A. Yeah. All right. Well, so we have a bunch of questions that have come in, actually. I want to start with one that we got that was based on one of the slides. So a lot of a few people are interested in how the longest subjects seem to have the highest open rate, but not a great response rate. So they're wondering why is this the case and do we have any data on this? Hmm. That's really interesting. Um, you know, what I can say generally is that the open rate and the response rate are not always aligned, which is quite interesting. So when you have a successful open rate, um, typically it means, you know, and this is obvious, that the subject line was engaging or that you have a good relationship you know, with the person that you pitched. When you have a good response rate, it means that the, the meat of the pitch uh, was good. It was you know, either a good message or it was the right person or both. Um, and so I don't have specific insight into why you know, the length of the subject line had a, a higher open rate and a lower response rate, but I can say that generally, you know, um, there are different factors that affect each of those. I have a I have a theory. It's a um, weird data point side theory, Aaron, and that is, uh, I don't know if you have used one of these mobile phone devices before. What's what's that? It, it, oh, it's yeah, a okay. mobile phone. It, it, it connects to the internet and also to cellular networks around the world. Oh Welcome gosh. to 2004. <laughs> um, but, but so the, the thing about this device is if you are reading your email on a device like this, which many of us are, and something has a long subject line, it gets cut off. And so you have to open it in order to see the full subject line. Hmm. And my theory would be that there are many long subject line emails that get opened and then deleted or archived, whereas short subject lines, you never have to open them. <laughs> I like that. I love that. <laughs> That's fascinating. So another question that we got actually is, um, what's the biggest mistake I could make in a cold email pitch? Yeah, um, you know, Sending from my perspective, <laughs> 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 yeah, that's even more fundamental than what I was going to say. Um, you know, it's it's when the journalist or the influencer can obviously tell that you just blasted this out to a bunch of people and you spent no time personalizing it to them. Like in Propel, we built this feature called Generate Drafts, which combines sort of mail merge with customization. So you can create you know, 10 drafts, you know, you want to pitch 10 people your news announcement and 85, 90% of that pitch is going to be the same in all those 10 drafts. But instead of it just going out as a mail merge, now you have those in your drafts folder. Now you can go in and write one line. You know, I loved your recent article about XYZ. I, that's one of my go-tos. I love that line. Um, you know, or, you know, reference something else personal about the person because no one likes to feel like they were just pitched you know, a blast email. I mean, if you, if they feel like you did their, your homework and, you know, you cared enough and took the time to personalize it, then you're much more likely to get a reply. Yep. hundred percent agree. Um, I don't know that I have a, a ton to add there, but okay. I, like I said, I just don't, I don't like sending fully cold pitches. I, I think that if you're going to bother to send a cold pitch, go do a little bit of warm interaction on social first or, or see if you can get a warm intro first and only do it if you've exhausted those avenues first because I think the high, high response rate and long-term relationship building with sources of influence is far, far better for your business and for your, you know, whether you're a consultant or an agency or in-house or whatever, just way, way more useful to start building relationship than to blast email 100 people, even with something very customized, my preference would still be have a warm interaction or get an intro before you send it. Yeah, I love that tip. Um, I love that tip because it's a lot, look, it's, let's be real, it's a lot more work to do that, but yeah. it, the payoff will be, the, 
the payoff will be way, way better. And, and it's such a long, like you get to play the long game that way. If you, because once you've established any type of connection between the person, right? Like, you know, Zach and I don't know each other, but you know, oh, well, we had a few email interactions and then we did that webinar together back in, you know, 2022. And so, you know, three years from now, Zach reaches out to me or I reach out to him and it, it's it's the network effect. Like it's so much more powerful to build that up over time. Even if the initial pitch, that one pitch wasn't accepted, just think if you treat every single human being like a human being that you want to have a relationship with long-term that you hope can help you over multiple decades and you want to help them over multiple decades, comes back to you, my friends. Well awesome. said. Well said indeed. So another question that we got here is what KPIs do you each find the most meaningful for earned media coverage? And are there any that you would recommend for PR only and not other types of marketing? Rand, you wanna take that one first? Uh, so I, I have one number that I care about kind of above and beyond virtually anything else. And that is what percent of the audience that I wanna reach follows or engages with this source of influence. So, you know, basically let's say, you know, let's say I am in um, product, the product packaging industry, and I want packaging design professionals in Europe to see my um, whatever article to, to be exposed to my brand, right? That's my goal. What I don't care about is you know, total number of readers of the publication, or um, I don't know, the estimate of traffic or domain authority, right? Like an SEO metric that has wound its way kind of into PR world. Um, I sometimes feel weird about creating that back at Moz. Uh, and, and, you know, th there's lots of other kinds of things, right? Share and that sort of stuff. But I love the, oh, okay, whatever, 16% of people who have packaging design in their bio, uh, follow packaging world Europe. That's the number for me. That's the one I care about the most. Yeah, that's interesting. For me, <clears throat> um, it's far and away the business outcomes from earned media. So, um, you know, understanding the direct attribution and the general correlation of how your earned media articles are affecting traffic, are affecting online purchases, downloads, you know, any other conversion that's important to you as a business. Um, and, you know, that's like at the core of Propel. That was one of the very first things was our business outcomes dashboard, you know, to finally make, you know, uh, earned media a discipline where you could understand like the, the outcomes on your business from those, from those efforts. So Zach, I, I apologize. I should have been more familiar with this from the outcome, but instead I will, I will <laughs> maybe you could explain to me. So let's say, okay, SparkToro gets, um, I, I don't know, uses Propel, gets some coverage in Wired. Mm -hmm. And then how does it track, like the people who saw or read or engaged with that Wired article, how does it know the impact on, uh, I don't know, our new free signups over the next 30 days or something? Yeah, great question. So we have a Google Analytics integration. And so if there was a backlink in the Wired article um, about SparkToro, then anyone who clicked on that backlink in the article, we would then be able to show, okay, okay you know, you, you received 500 visitors to your site and, you know, three downloads and, and one online purchase. And it can track any goal that you have set up in your Google Analytics. Got it. So any form submission, any other goal that you have set up. But then the second most important piece, uh, Rand, is that you know not every article has that backlink. And we know that that's not the full uh, you know, uh, ROI from PR. You just, it's much bigger than I, I feel like it's like 1% of it. Exactly. And that's why we also show the more important part, which is the general correlation. So we show in our business outcomes dashboard, the total traffic to your site and the total goal completions of your site. And then we overlay that with when you had articles published. Oh, cool. And you can immediately visually see like, 
oh, wow, we had a huge spike in traffic on that day that we had the Forbes article. Hmm. Mm. Interesting. Love it. I love that. Okay. This, so we sort of do this a little bit manually in Spark Toro's own GA where we're like, you know, if Amanda or I are whatever on a podcast or we get like a mention on a big email list, for example, um, we were in a, someone's email distro list day before yesterday, sent us a bunch of great traffic. We can't see it, right? You can't see it in GA because the link is private and blah, 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 third-party cookies, et cetera, et cetera. It looks like dark traffic or direct, but we'll just annotate in Google Analytics, hey, we were featured on this podcast or so-and-so's list or whatever. And then you can see the lift to SparkToro, which happens a ton. Um, so that's a, that's a very, very cool feature. I love that, Zach. I feel like, man, you could justify a Propel just with that. Absolutely. When are we doing your demo, Rand? <laughs> <laughs> no, but one other uh, thing I wanted to just say, you know, from the very, very beginning of Propel, um, we integrated most score. So that's been a central uh, metric that we offer our users for multiple years already. And um, we love it. I mean, we think domain authority is, is quite important as well. So after business outcomes, I would say domain authority. So we have one other question. I think it's a follow-up to the one we were just talking about is what do you believe is the most effective means of proving value of earned media efforts to a company's leadership? I would, I would piggyback on the business outcomes. I think, you know, having that data and also just as importantly, making it accessible to senior execs. So like having, you know, easy to understand reports, even like shareable dashboards, um, which we've also built in Propel, just like making that data really clear, re really accessible. So you can shoot it off to the CEO, to the CMO, um, and, you know, and, and they can easily see, you know, how, how the PR efforts are affecting the business. Yeah, I like, um, I, I found two things to be most effective for kind of convincing a skeptical team of executives or leadership um, or a board to make a, a big investment in a new marketing tactic or channel. And that tends to be one, when you experiment and show value from it, right? So, hey, boss, how about next month you give us a small budget or a small amount of our time to go do a small amount of PR with some sources that we're pretty sure would, would work out and then let's see how that affects our business outcomes the next 60 days. What's our lift over what we ordinarily would have gotten, right? What we would have expected from the rest of our efforts. That, that's a reasonable one, right? You're, you're kind of making a data-backed case. You can use um, the, annota the manual annotation method, right, that we use or, or Propel's system where it actually correlates it. That's far more sophisticated. The other one that kind of works well and can be a cheat code is here's five of our competitors and all the press they're getting that we're not getting. And here's what happens when you search Google for these topics. And here's what happens in Google Discover and Apple News and Google News. And you know, if you're reading the, whatever, the, the subreddits, if you're following it on Flipboard, you can see that our competitors are getting talked about all the time and we are not present. For some reason, e even though this is far less data-driven, there's a lot of executive behavior that is driven on fear of missing out and competition. And that works pretty well to convince people to uh, invest as well. Yeah, I love that. I think we have time for maybe one more question and then um, we're, we're kind of running out of time, but let's go with this one. Um, this is an interesting one. I'm kind of curious both of your opinions on this. Is the response rate, do you think, higher with an editor and a ready article or with the journalist and some materials for the article? This is a little bit outside the zone of my expertise, but I will say that when I have pitched, um, generally I'm not pitching with a, a, with a full article, but I am almost always pitching, uh, at least for my own projects with, um, essentially an angle and a story and a style of like, here's what I think we should do together already made, which reduces the workload substantially. I 
I haven't done the classic like, hey, let me pitch a journalist with an article that they can basically edit a tiny bit and then publish, but. Uh, yeah, and I would say that um, it depends on the publication. Uh, yeah, like that, that's a lot right. of publications, if they have a lot of staff writers, then pitching them, uh, you know, sort of a concept as Rand was saying, or like a, a, an angle, a pitch, you know, a paragraph. Um, but there's also publications where they're shorter staffed on full-time writers and they love publishing bylined articles. Yeah. Um, so both can work. Um, just know the publication that you're pitching and then um, you know, understand what kinds of content they prefer. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, Rand, thanks so much for joining Zach. This has been great, everybody. Um, if, for, if we didn't get to your questions, I apologize and we'll, we'll definitely get to those cap when we, when we send that out. And if you have any questions um, about anything we talked about today, please feel free to email me at Aaron at propelmypr.com um, and stay tuned for more of our webinars coming up soon. And thanks so much for joining. Thanks Thank everybody. You, Take care. Thank you, Take care. Cheers. Take care.